model um, earlier. And um, you would also would have thought that she and I sort of planned this whole um, information sharing because this is like, you would have thought we spent hours dovetailing what you're going to hear from me with the foundation that she's already laid for us. So awesome. So I already had written down here that our um, one of our spiritual warriors, Audrey Lord, when addressing groups would often say, I am a black lesbian mother warrior poet doing her work. Who are you? So in that vein, what I will say to you is that I am a white cisgender lesbian chaplain, daughter, spouse, Christian doing my work. So I will do the overview of this. Our, my hope is that we will do some trans terminology 101, some more terminology work. Um, and then I will um, share with you some of the things that um, we do in the, the uh, transgender clinic at Cincinnati Children's Hospital where I work. I work in a pediatric setting. Um, and then I will give us some theological underpinnings and reflection about how you might consider grounding the work that you do with scripture. This will not be about the seven clobber passages and how to put them in context, just to be clear. We're not going there because you will never win an argument about that, okay? So let's start, right? Overview of terminology, as Michael was just saying, a lot of people will ask what the asterisk means after trans, asterisk 101. So as he has said, it's a huge umbrella, umbrella term that refers to all kinds of identities on the gender identity spectrum, right? Also what Aaron talked about earlier. So it includes things such as transgender, gender queer, gender variant, gender creative, gender expansive, gender fluid, two spirit, gender non-conforming, and whatever else folks who are in that place how they choose to define themselves and we learn from them about what language is important to them. And as we talked about before, when we talk about transgender, it's frequently talked about as one's gender identity, right? The internal experience of who we are, not matching the sex assigned at birth. So in terms of some of the alphabet soup, that you might see. Um, Aaron mentioned some with um, what we say at the hospital, AFAB or AMAB. Um, we say assigned female at birth. What was your word? Announced. Announced. Yeah. Announced. Okay. So at the hospital, we do assigned female at birth, um, assigned male at birth, but sometimes it's also the other way around with MAAB which is male assigned at birth, right? It's just a little, or female assigned at birth. Um, and then there's also um, intersex, which we have not talked much about. Um, I will say that at our clinic and at our institution, we have a separate clinic that deals with uh, children who are born intersexed. They are not seen in our transgender clinic. We have a whole nother set of experts that deal with just that piece, which is quite amazing, quite amazing. Okay. Um, the, just so you know, in case you see this, some of the old alphabet soup, some of the old terminology that was being used before was MTF or FTM, which is um, male to female transition or female to male transition, but much more, it is the announced female at birth or assigned female at birth pieces these days. So just to review, right, the definition of sex is based on genitalia, it's science, right? What kind of genitalia do you have when you come out into the world, right? Male, female, 
intersexed. A couple of um, definitions and sort of fun pictures to go with it, right? I mean, you can't beat Billy Porter. Um, so gender variance, right? Two possible ways, two definitions to think about. So gender variance can be seen as new combinations of gender traits and unique expressions of self and physical appearance that defy conventional categorization. Right? So what societal norms expect and how we present ourselves may or may not be closely aligned. Another option from PFLAG in 2017 um, is this definition, those who dress, behave, or express themselves in a way that does not conform with the dominant gender norms. I love this part of it. Non-conformists are sometimes simply ahead of their time. Mm -hmm. What I also like to say frequently at the hospital when we have kids that, you know, their medical conditions um, are just, we can't figure out exactly what's going on, right? And I would say what we're learning now about our transgender youth mm -hmm. is that what I frequently will say is they're just ahead of science, right? We have not caught up to where they are. They are setting the pace for us and we just haven't figured it out yet. And sooner or later, we hope to catch up to where they are and where they're leading us. And so um, Aaron also did this review. You see what I'm saying? Like you would have thought we'd like plan this, right? Um, definitions of sexual attraction. So um, on the continuum, right? We have at one end females, the other at then maybe male and then all of these other things. So pansexual, in my understanding, um, is not limited, someone who is not limited in sexual choice with regards to their biological sex, right? Gender or gender identity. So pansexuality, pan means like inclusive all, right? When you break down the Latin. So pansexuality is one of the broadest terms of sexuality, right? Because the prefix, as I said, pan means all. And in the context of sexuality, it could mean that pansexuals are, form, are uh, capable of forming sexual and romantic attraction to all people, whether or not these people identify within the gender binary. So asexual is a person who does not experience sexual attraction. And then to our earlier point in conversation, demisexual or demiromantic is a person who is drawn first to the other person's personality, right? They're drawn to the personality, as Aaron said, like they would just like to hang out with you or they love you, but then they're hanging out with you, but they're not drawn because of physical or sexual attraction to begin with, right? And they might not even be interested in any physical or sexual contact. And then guess what my next slide is? Ta-da! Once again, the gender unicorn is back. Da, da, da. I will also say that um, before the, there was the gender unicorn, there was the gender person. Right, and um, same kind of uh, outline arrows and categories, but it was the the um, the gingerbread person. Gingerbread. Yeah, the gingerbread person. So that was the first round, and then the unicorn came to visit us, and is you can still find both of these easily online if you ever want to use them. I'm not going to review all that since we did such a good job of that with Aaron. But let's talk about etiology, right? Like the cause of what we think may be influencing uh, trans and gender fluidity. We know this much. We know that it's multifactorial, right? Meaning many uh, 
factors, many things that contribute to this. So culture-wise, right, as um, we talked about briefly, who was it that mentioned the Taiwan, was it Taiwanese culture? Indonesian. Indonesian culture, right, okay. So culturally, in non-Western other cultures, right, there is a wide range of beliefs about gender and definitions of what masculine and feminine are. Genetically, we know that there are LGB, right, lesbian, gay, bisexual clusters in families. It runs in my family. My cousin is gay, I'm gay, right? other folks and we know from the the genome project when they were mapping the genome that they did find genetic uh, um, markers right for the lesbian gay um, marker carried in the maternal line so we know there's a piece of that but we're not quite sure how all that works right biologically we do know from scans and um, all those wonderful scientific ways they can plot and um, show differences in brain um, construction that gender variant people have some other brain structures that are different than cisgender people. And we know that it involves the hypothalamus gland. We don't know all of why that is, but we're learning. Combined with, as Erin mentioned, uh, the hormonal compound, right? The, the, the prenatal in utero, as the, as the, as the um, infant is developing, the exposure um, to the androgens, which is a fancy word for hormones, right? Exposure to the hormones can cause brace, uh, changes in the brain and changes in the glands, but um, it's interesting because once those changes may happen and they can measure all of that, what happens postnatally after they are born is that those changes do not continue forward. So it's somehow set in utero and then this is who this person is, right? When they come out. And let me also just mention the next piece, which is what it is not. We do know that contrary to misinformation that is circulating in the world, Environmentally, there is no evidence that parenting style, abuse, um, or other kinds of um, uh, environmental influences will uh, change or shape sexual orientation or gender identity because we know that that is set within the person, right? Now, in our clinic and in the clinics who follow the W path or the US path, right? Um, remind me again, uh, W path is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. So um, the standard of, of um, the standards of care, right? In pediatric clinics, the developmental approach with children is we are fluid flexible view of gender, because we know it is not necessarily set in stone with children. Right? We are allowing for cognitive and developmental uh, perspectives, right? Because we know that development of a person's identity happens over time and happens at a much younger age than we first thought. Exploration of cultural norms by children part of the normal developmental pattern of what happens. Because the goal is what? Successful integration into adulthood, right? We want happy, healthy, safe, contributing members to society who are using their God-given talents to the best of their ability, right? So, here are things we look for. In our clinic, we um, will see young adults until the age of 25, which is unusual, but because of needing to help them transition to adult care, um, we will see them until they're 25. We see children as young as two. 
because we know that by the age of two, there are certain pieces of individuals' personalities that are set. It is not unusual for some families who come to us to say, my daughter has been saying she's a boy since she learned how to talk. That happens. That's a, that's a real thing, right? So we see kids across a wide age range. What we look for is this. Is the child being consistent, persistent, and insistent about their identity, about who they are saying they are over time, right? But as we know, and Aaron mentioned, right, young kids are not going to have the language for this, right? So what do we look for behaviorally? These are the common things that show up. Aversion to bathroom usage. I'm assigned female at birth. I do not want to use the girl's bathroom. I want to use the boy's bathroom. So what that frequently means is I will not go to the bathroom while I am at school, which then means we see them with horrendous urinary tract infections because they hold their urine all day over time. Right? So behavior around bathroom usage, swimsuit aversion, very common with kids. Signed female at birth, they want to wear swimming trunks, right? Well, we know that up until a certain age, that's fine because you really can't tell the difference between boys and girls, right? It's not a problem, whatever. Um, until whatever that sort of marker is for families where they say, okay, you're old enough now, you need to start wearing a female bathing suit or a male suit. And the kid doesn't want to do that. Not what matches their sex assigned at birth because that's not who I am they will refuse to put on a swimming suit unless they can choose what they want. We also see it in the kinds of underwear, right? Are you choosing Power Rangers, Spider-Man, you know, um, Frozen, right? The underwear from Frozen with all of the princes on it. Um, what kind of underwear? And a number of kids, um, hooray for our parents who show up and say, well, the last time you we went to Target, she picked up Spider-Man underwear, which was fine. But this last time um, she got, um, I don't know, give me a female, traditionally female, uh, Barbie, Dora the Explorer. Yeah, there we go, right? So great for those families that aren't freaking out and say, great, do both. Because guess what? You need no underwear anyway, right? Um, we also see a difference in the types of toys, you know, things that might, we might think of as traditionally male toys or female toys and being drawn to those, right? And probably most importantly, be, when we're looking at the consistent, persistent, and insistent behavior, what is the child saying once they are using language? So are they saying, for instance, I am a boy, or I am a girl versus I wish I were a boy or I wish I were a girl, right? You catch the difference, right? One is this is who I am versus, well, I wish I was because like boys get all the cool toys, right? So we hear that, right? I am, again, we have parents whose kids are two, three, four. From the time they were able to speak, they have been saying to me, I am a boy. And she's not, well, maybe, but maybe not. So again, to counter all of the misinformation that is fear-based, right? What do we do to support our younger children? There are no medical interventions, right? We are not forcing hormones on to children. There are no medical interventions. It is impossible because first of all they haven't hit puberty they're hormonally it is not there's nothing to do right children have to start puberty in order for treatments to be offered 
at our place, if they're approaching puberty, they also have to work with a gender appropriate therapist for at least a year and get a letter from the therapist saying that they feel that they've explored their gender and that this is who this child is. Um, we certainly will encourage social transition because what Erin showed us on her slide, totally reversible and can cover anything from age newborn to 85. You can always reverse that. We will also offer our families uh, lots of support, support groups, a uh, variety of information and resources. And for the kids who are school age, we will also offer what we call a safe letter. And our physicians sign that and uh, parents can take it to school so that they can talk with the school about bathroom usage. And the safe letter explains that. And even if they need to come up with an option to say, okay, when you need to go to the bathroom, you come to the nurse's, the nurse's room, right? It's not ideal, but okay. Or you use the bathroom in the teacher's lounge or you whatever, but they deal with the bathroom usage issue. Jess? Um, for the therapist uh, that helps to explore gender, is that primarily, is that for insurance purposes? Is that just for the general well-being of the person? Because I know for a long time, and in some cases, it's still required that if somebody wants to physically transition, that they would be required to meet with the therapist, even as an adult. So, mm -hmm. I mean, to, to, to sort of prove themselves, I guess. Yeah. Is there a, a motivation um, behind that? For us in Ohio, um, it's um, two prong. For those patients who are 18 and over, um, we do not require the letter. It may, it, I mean, that's fine if they're working with a therapist and they bring that. Um, but for those under 18, it's really an exploration, just like it would be if they're on puberty blockers to help them explore who they are and that they're doing that work to work through and identify who they are, right? right? It, but it's two pronged because sometimes the insurance companies will, will require that. It depends on their insurance, okay. right? So it could be either or, or it could be both. Okay. So we know about social transitioning, right? As we talked about before, externally presenting in one's authentic gender, entirely reversible. And um, we encourage that a lot. Um, for those of you who are um, joining us online um, as well, I'll just say this though, it, this may be known for many people, but I don't assume. Um, if you hear reference to a um, person's dead name, right? dead name, that is the name that is given at birth when the parents thought, I have this boy or girl, um, but uh, is no longer the chosen name that the person chooses to be called by, right? So if your dead name, the name you were given at birth is Alexandria, you might choose Alex, huh? or you might choose George. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be like a shortened form of your dead name, um, though for many people it is. Um, or, you know, Benjamin could be Kathleen. Right? So just FYI, when you hear a dead name, um, that's what that means. So there's sort of a little foundation, right? Now, I know you will find this shocking. So I'm glad you're all sitting down. People watching us via Zoom, make sure you're seated because this next truth will send you reeling. Religious institutions and science, it has not always been the most comfortable relationship. So I always tell the parents I'm dealing with that the church has Always, 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 always dragged behind science. Kicking and screaming, we sometimes have to drag the church into a current um, understanding. So we know for things like, um, as we mentioned with Joan of Arc, 
Um, also, Galileo was convicted of heresy for um, his scientific hypothesis um, that he agreed with the Copernican view that the earth rotated around the sun, right? Not that the earth was the center of the universe. He was put in jail for three years and then he spent the rest of his life under house arrest. It took more than 300 years for the church to admit that Galileo was correct and to clear his name. Years before Galileo, a Lutheran guy by the name of Johann Kepler was excommunicated by the Lutherans for believing the same thing that Galileo posited. And he was considered a heretic because he also believed that unlike the description in Genesis of the moon being a lesser light, meaning it's just a lesser light of the sun, that it was actually a solid planet. Excommunicated. Right. We already talked about Joan of Arc. What I will add is that 25 years after she was burned at the stake, her name was cleared. Kind of too late. Yeah. And then we have all of the beliefs about, you know, people um, in the early church being brought to clergy because clergy were also considered physicians, right? To, and they were healers in the early church. And then we discovered things like germs and antibiotics. And all of a sudden, like, hmm, like you mean there's more to it than maybe just, you know, only getting prayed over, right? So I always say to folks, you know, you may be struggling with what the church has to say about gender expression, but you also have to remember there was a time when they thought that clergy were healers until we discovered germs and then we discovered antibiotics. And I don't know too many people that are going to their priest to be prayed over when they have bronchitis. Most of us just go get an antibiotic. And then again, we have, you know, the Bible usage to justify slavery and interracial marriage. So we have a long, not pleasant history as a church. So once again, right, we're in the tension of science teaching us what is being discovered about transgender development and the church not ready to fully embrace that reality. So it's up to us to continue to offer God's extravagant welcome. I'm going to share with you a short video clip from um, Gender Revolution by National Geographic with Katie Couric about the science of what we know right now. Okay. We know that scientists believe that something happens to the trans brain while it's developing in utero. But there's also some evidence from human brains examined postmortem that seems to show trans brains are in fact different. At ground zero is the hypothalamus, the tiny nerve center that controls your heart rate, sleep, and metabolism. Scientists initially believed that the hypothalamus of a gay man would resemble that of a woman. But what they found surprised them. Down below, we have the staining pattern of a gay man. The picture above is the staining pattern of a straight man. And observe, there is no difference between the gay man and the straight man. However, over here, in this corner, we have the staining pattern for a transgender woman. And observe that even though her external body parts at birth may have been male, she has the same staining pattern as the non-transgender, as the cisgender woman. What it tells us is that there are areas in the brain that correlate with gender identity and not with external body parts. But it's not just hormones, like testosterone, influencing how our brains are wired. It may also be in our genes. Why do scientists think that? A 2012 study out of Belgium found that among fraternal twins who do not share identical DNA, the likelihood that if one twin is trans, the other will be, is very low. But among identical twins, the likelihood shoots up to 40%. What does that mean? Well, what that says to me is that your DNA is playing a role here because 
the identical twins essentially share the same DNA, whereas the non-identical twins don't. We don't know if this is one gene or eight genes or a group of genes that are affected in slightly different ways, but I absolutely do believe that we will have a day when we can do either a brain scan or a blood test, and we will be able to say that, yes, your kid has the biology in their brain for the opposite gender identity. And my signing friends um, will work on how we can do that better. Yeah, it's fascinating science and a really good special for people that haven't seen it. But do you fear that, like that last statement that was made, it leads to corrective type of practices? Um, yeah, I um, I've thought about that uh, some, and um, I mean, I guess the I don't know, right? In the effort to explain more of what we know, to try and just put it in context to say this is a part of normal human development and expression for some people, just like blue eyes or blonde hair or brown eyes are. Um, I guess it always runs the risk, right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I show um, these two name tags for a couple different reasons. The one on the left is my uh, name tag at work. And our institution um, has recently um, offered pronoun badges for everyone who would like to wear them. We also have um, the um, transgender and uh, rainbow sticker option and um, Black Lives Matter uh, stickers that we can put on our name tag. So sort of the equivalent when we were talking about the safe space stickers in classrooms, um, for us, the rainbow um, and trans stickers um, communicate, I'm a safe person to talk to. The one on the right is my name tag from church. And so um, we have done um, pronoun options, stickers you can put on your name tag, as well as um, we have a constant display table available for all kinds of gender, ONA, uh, open and affirming kinds of things in the back. But I think for me, one of the stories I wanna share with you is about um, the difference that having these stickers on my name tag um, made. I, um, in the hospital, um, when there are um, patients who are seen in our clinic who are admitted inpatient to the hospital, I will get a notification from one of our nurse practitioners um, that somebody is inpatient. And um, at our place, 99% of the time, it doesn't have anything to do with their gender identity. I mean, they could be there because they're getting a tonsils out or an appendectomy or something else. But I always make a point of stopping in to see them. So um, I went in to see Jennifer, and Jennifer um, was in because of an infection in her hip bone. So I walked in, and I guess for those um, who are also wondering about, like, afraid of making mistakes in in gendering or how to respond to people, um, what I will say to you is, it certainly takes time and um, patience with yourself, but also um, it, cre it can create cognitive dissonance, right? So I walked into this patient's room and she had not started any kind of hormonal transitioning. So, um, and she was in her early twenties, but physi physically, right? Still had lots of body hair, a full beard, um, longer hair, and chosen name was Jennifer, pronouns were she, her. So I really had to work because of my own bias, right, of thinking to remember, right? So I go to see her, I stop in, and I introduce myself. And clearly it says 
chaplain. Luckily for me, this badge was attached to a, a holder that um, it would expand, like you could pull it, you know, it was on string because she saw my name tag and she literally grabbed it and she pulled it to her. And she looked at it and she looked at the sticker and she looked up at me and she goes, shit, you're a chaplain? I said, yes, <laughs> I am. I said, in, the, in my, you know, great intuitive pastoral care skills said, gosh, that seems to surprise you. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm a trained professional, right? So, um, and she replied, huh, I didn't expect that. And I said, why not? Right? And I almost started crying. Her reply to me was, I never thought a clergy person would ever come visit me. Right? And then she then went on to tell me how she had been alienated from her church, how when she came out, her family was asked to leave. And um, all of the rejection that she had experienced around that, right? So I listened to that. And um, I frequently find myself, you know, apologizing on behalf of the institution, right? Mm -hmm. But hoping that in some small way for her to have a different experience with a clergy person in this way, will bring some modicum of healing in a way that I will never know, but just to know that maybe it will plant a seed that, you know, all churches and all pastors aren't assholes. Amen. You know what I'm saying? It's hard. It's, it's, a, it's a very hard thing because you don't know what you're walking into. Right? But then it was interesting because my next experience with the stickers, was a whole different piece because I had a family, um, I was working still at that point, in addition to the transgender clinic in oncology, which is where I've spent the first 21 years of my time at Children's was in oncology in some form. So I met with this family numerous times and um, his son was currently inpatient and this dad and mom were very welcoming and we'd had a lot of conversation and I knew from what they had shared with me that they were pretty conservative in their theology. So I'm walking down the main hallway of the hospital one day and he's walking the other way toward the cafeteria and we say hi and we pass and he turns around and he says, hey, chaplain. I came back, I said, yeah. And he goes, um, I'm noticing that a lot of people have those stickers on their badges, the rainbow and the Translate. He said, so, so what is that? What, what's up with that? And I said, well, um, for us here at the hospital, um, we, those of us who choose to wear those stickers do so because we are intentionally welcoming of LGBTQI uh, children and adolescents and parents, and we want them to know that we're safe people for, for them to talk to. And so then I explained the flag and all of that. And he says, really? And I said, huh? And he said, huh, I had no idea. And he walked away. What happened after that was they didn't want to visit with me anymore, right? So all that is to say, right? We have this relationship. He finds out this one piece. And then he doesn't want to visit, right? So all that is to say that sometimes by the choices we make to be affirming, it will cost us in other ways, right? Because that's, for me, I mean, that's the call of the gospel, right? We respond and then we see, and not everyone is ready to hear that good news. So I'm just reminded how the difference is striking, right? So for one, for Jennifer, the stickers are a point of liberation and freedom. 
And for Tony and his family, it was a sign of um, misunderstanding, not understanding, and probably for him, oppression or judgment about what that means for me as a chaplain and pastoral care provider. So um, the question then becomes, right? We are in a position of straddling science and scripture and how we bridge that gap. Okay? So how are we offering God's extravagant welcome one person at a time? Okay? So some of the things that I found helpful when I've tried, um, you know, what I was trying to show um, in the story about Jennifer was trying to move out of our comfort zone, right? So we try to connect with the other person. We bear witness to the pain that has been caused by the institutional church or and or clergy and or church members. We offer apology on behalf of what has happened, owning the fact um, that we, as a part of that institution, have not been the most welcoming or hospitable often intentionally um, rejecting. And we offer an alternative experience of God's welcome in this exchange, right? Frequently, I will pray with families and um, I often will end the prayer if I know that they are some flavor of Christian um, with something like this, right? So we pray for whatever we're praying for, right? So for good, for good test outcomes or successful surgery, whatever, whatever. And then I will say, and I pray all these things in the name of the one who knows what it is to walk in our shoes and lie in our beds, to be human like us, Jesus, the Christ, right? Because for me, theologically, the humanity of Jesus is more important than the Christology. Because where do we know what it is to be human? It is with the interactions of the stories we know from scripture where Jesus is interacting as a human being with other human beings. Right? So I think by doing that, I will say that at least one person at a time, we can try and offer a little bit of the kingdom, right? K-I-N dash D-O-M, not K-I-N-G, but K-I-N as in kin, right? Sure. Um, I pray all this in the name of the one who knows what it is to walk in our shoes and lie in our beds to be human like us. Jesus the Christ. Environmentally, what is it that we're trying to communicate to those who come to us, right? In the church, in our office, in the hospital, right? <laughs> so our goal is to provide a safe, comfortable space so that those in our care feel comfortable discussing anything, feel comfortable asking questions, and no concern about discrimination. Um, the, our goal is not to out people. So kind of like what Mary shared, I think it was Mary shared yesterday about the um, 20 kids showing up, right? Because you offered to say, you can come here, it's safe. As we know, right, for people who are trans, queer, gender expansive, gender fluid, right? Constant hypervigilance about the environment. What cues are they picking up? Is it safe for me to be here, right? So what we try to do, at least at our place, is that the commonly shared areas, waiting rooms, bathrooms, hallways, should reflect the people 
that we serve, right? So we try to have artwork on the walls that is welcoming of everyone. Um, we have non-discrimination policies in place, but we also have done things like besides the stickers on the badges, we make sure that all of our forms um, have been updated. So we've done a lot in our institution with making sure that rather than saying on the form, mother, father, it just says parent guardian. And it is whatever it is, right? Um, on our baptismal forms in the uh, chaplaincy office, parent, guardian, right? Not mother, father. So what are the kind of some of the languages that you might be able to use? Um, statement of identity, if you're involved with the congregation, right? So um, what's on your website? What signs are outside? What does it look like when you, people walk in the door? What does that environment look? Is there a gender neutral bathroom available, right? Sometimes it's as easy as changing a sign. In the church I'm involved with, it was really easy because we had to put in a handicap accessible bathroom. So we also made it the gender neutral bathroom. And I always use that bathroom as much as possible because A, it's just a lot roomier and I'm not squashed into a very small space. So, you know, it could kind of work for everybody. Um, so. And now we pause for some humor. <laughs> what to do with when you are a spork? Do you go to the spoon bathroom or to the fork bathroom? What to do? So let me offer um, some scriptural foundational work as we think about options. Um, so what I will say is that what I want to share with you in terms of scripture and the theology around all that, um, this is not transgender theology because I'm not a transgender person, right? So I am not doing transgender theology. That is for our transgender um, siblings to do and to teach us. But I am sharing with you at least where I have chosen to ground myself for the work that I do with the trans and gender expansive community at the hospital. So one place that I um, start is um, with Psalm 139, right? So it's in, so what happens in Psalm 139, one of the things that happens that I love about this Psalm is that God is inescapable, right? So God is, um, so the, the psalmist is saying to God, right? For it was you who formed my inward parts. You, God, knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame, my being, was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. So two things about this. One is that this is definitely a word of hope, right? Because God is coming to the psalmist. Right? God is in relationship with the psalmist, not the other way around. So this implies a level of intimacy right? Because it's, it's the use of I and thou, right? I praise you. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You knit me together. I thou relationship. Right? The other thing is this. In those verses, when it says, um, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The word in Hebrew, fearfully, is Yara is transliterated as Y-A-R-A. -A, right? It means awe, reverent respect, and honor. Okay? In, in the Hebrew, 
Bible in the Hebrew scriptures, it's a synonym, a synonym for love. For I am reverently made, right? Fearfully, reverently made. And the word in Hebrew for wonderful, right? I am fearfully and wonderfully made, or I am reverently and wonderfully made. The one, the word in Hebrew for wonderful is pala, P-A-L-A, which means to be different, striking, or remarkable. Right? Outside the power of human comprehension. Right? Outside the power. We are made outside of the um, power of human comprehension for us to fully understand each other because it is so awe-inspiring. The act of God on behalf of humanity. Right? So you could translate the verse, I am fearfully and wonderfully made as I am reverently and strikingly made. In the nuance, right? I am reverently holy, right? I am reverently and strikingly made. The other text, uh, one of the other texts that I like to use is uh, from Jeremiah. And I use this in a lot of contexts, right? Um, I use it when I'm celebrating communion. I use it in a lot of other contexts, but in this particular context for our gender expansive trans folks, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says God. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. Not for harm. To give you a future with hope. Right? The context of this in Jeremiah is that it was a word of hope to people in exile, right? Israel was in the midst of the Babylonian exile for 70 years, to be exact, right? And the word of hope is to the community that you will be returned and redeemed, right? You will come back to your home. So what I mentioned earlier um, when Aaron was presenting um, about what is our job for these youth that are so at risk, right? 40 to 45% suicidality, right? In a study that one of my colleagues and I did when we were screening for spiritual distress among the patients and caregivers that come to clinic, my colleague would often say, right? Our, our goal is really simple. We need to keep these kids alive, right? We need to keep them alive because when you can't see the forest from the trees, you need someone to be the hope bearer for you. Right? Our job is to be hope bearers. Right? Here's the Isaiah passage. We talked about earlier. A welcoming home of the foreigners and eunuchs, Isaiah 56, three to eight, right? Promising a place of honor. God says to Isaiah and the people in exile, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Yeah, Sorry, it's showing up over here, <laughs> which I always get confused because it's actually showing me on the right-hand side, the slide that comes next, and that's where I get confused. I have to look on the left, which is good. Look on the left. Okay. Um, 
So it's also um, a little bit later, later in that same passage that God says, I, my house will be a home for all people, a place of prayer and home for all people and intentionally names the eunuch, mm -hmm. right? All are welcome here. So this particular passage was really important in that day and time because um, this is third Isaiah, right? So the, the, I don't know if you know this, but the, some of us know this, the, the book of Isaiah is written at three different time periods, right? So there's the first set of chapters that is before they are taken into exile, before Israel goes into exile. And then there is the middle section of chapters that was written while they were in exile. And then the third section of chapters when they are coming home out of exile. So this piece is when they are returning from exile, but the generations who have been there have intermarried with their captors. And so this word of hope is really powerful because um, part of the goal for the Jewish people was always to stay pure, to not mix themselves with the Gentiles, but some did for a number of reasons, including survival, right? To not be killed by their captors. And here is God saying, you are welcome to, right? Totally um, blew up cultural norms, right? because this is a God of an extravagant woman. And then naming the eunuchs, right? Eunuchs existed outside of the accepted gender roles and expectations of their time. They filled, fulfilled a particular role in caring for the royalty, but most of them had been forcefully castrated, not by their own choice, and put into place to care for royalty in the palace. So now they are coming home, but now they have technically nowhere to go. They're outside their own people who will not welcome them. But God says, you are welcome here. Right? So um, a guy named Austin Harkey, he's a biblical scholar and a trans man. He says in his book, Transforming, that he felt an immediate connection to the eunuch and the foreigner in this passage because of the fear of separation, the fear of being forgotten, the fear of being kept out of God's family, all based on identities that were as unchosen by those people as the place of their birth or the shape of their body, right? They had no say in those things about them. And so they were worried that they would be outcast. So this passage from Acts in um, the story of Philip and the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch. So we read of God's desire in the early days of the early church to include eunuchs and foreigners in the assembly. <laughs> And if you know anything about this story, um, Philip ends up at the end of the story baptizing this eunuch. So Harkey says, um, besides being a eunuch, this is an Ethiopian eunuch. So he was from Ethiopia, which at the time would have symbolized the end of the earth, right? Because it was so far away from what the Jewish people knew. So as an Ethiopian, he was also probably much darker skinned, much more black than the Jewish folks that he would have interacted with. And so he's in between because he's reading scripture, he believes in God, he's not Jewish, but he's also not quite Gentile. He was not born Jewish, but he has become a um, worshiper of the God of Israel. So he's between times, right? He's, he's established, he's in, he was in between or outside of the established categories when it came 
to the Jew Gentile binary of the time. He's on a wilderness road, which is sort of the nod to the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, the way the story is written. He's on a wilderness road. It's symbolic of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. But uh, Justin Saba Tanis, who's also um, a biblical scholar and a trans man, says the fact that the eunuch encounters Philip in the midst of all of these in-between spaces affirms the working of God outside of human boundaries and convention. <laughs> right? God is bigger than that. Right? So there's another great little book, and this will all be in the resources. Uh, Linda Herzer uh, wrote a book entitled The Bible and the Transgender Experience. A gender, um, uh, why the, how the Bible supports gender variance. And in her study of the scripture, she ends with saying, a gender variant black African eunuch is baptized and brought into the family of God. This particular passage from Matthew, um, I gained a new appreciation for, right? So there's a whole story um, of Jesus speaking to the disciples and to the crowd. And he's quoted, the quote goes, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. In my experience, this passage has gotten a lot of bad press, bad theology about sacrificing and you have to suffer and you know blah 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 but here's the twist that i found so refreshing um linda herzer in her book has a very helpful discussion i think of this text in the historical context of the scripture she argues that this text is really about jesus commanding us not to deny ourselves but to deny our false selves to deny our false selves. So to deny all of the voices and values that keep us trapped in the space, in that space and live out and to live out of our true self, right? So all of the social constraints, all of the expectations, all of how people choose to define us based on how we dress, how we present, who are we? To leave that, but the call is to deny that part of ourselves so that we can show up in our soulful, authentic way, created in the image of our God selves, despite what the world thinks of our choices. Right? So we are born with our gender identity. It's our core being, not a choice. Right? So the choice is the choice part of this is the choice that we make about how to live authentically, right? Are we choosing to drop the mask and the stuff that we do because of society's expectations? Do we choose to live authentically, which is the call of Jesus? Another break for humor. I don't know if you can see that, right? So the policeman has pulled over the butterfly who's driving and asked for the butterfly's license. And the butterfly's license has a picture of the butterfly as a caterpillar. And the butterfly is saying, that's an old photo. <laughs> so, so, Right? What is it that happens when we invite people to live authentically, right? Transformation. Transformation. So let me share another story with you to put it in context. Um, I met with this family and um, their parents, uh, the parents, um, I'll call them Debbie and Ken. Ken
came from a Protestant Christian background, non-denominational non Baptist. By the time we connected, I was the fourth clergy person they met with. They had been involved in a congregation where their two now son, not son and daughter, but their two sons still attended because of the youth group and having friends in the youth group. They had left that church over something not related to gender or coming out, some other reason, and they were attending a different church. So they had met with the pastor of the church where their kids were staying because of the youth group. They had met with the pastor of the church that they were currently attending. Right. And so, um, and then they also met with, at the time in Cincinnati, um, within the city limits, there was a conversion therapy pastor who had an office and they had met with them, with him. So first of all, clearly their faith is important to them and they're struggling. How, how am I going to integrate this? Right. So, um, I offered a couple of different options about how to approach scripture, how to think about what God's intent for humanity is, those kinds of things, right? And um, they had been told kind of all of the things that you might expect, like love the sinner, hate the sin, which basically is the same thing as saying reject your child, but right? Um, don't support um, any of the need, physical needs, so don't buy a binder. Don't support getting their haircut. Don't support, you know, the whole list of rules about what not to support, right? So um, when they got to the point that they went to the pastor who was doing conversion therapy, the mom, Debbie, said to me, Sue, I listened to what he was saying. And I said to him, so what you're telling me is that I need to make a choice between God and my child. This arrogance is just beyond me. To which this pastor replied, yes, and you will choose God. And she said, if that is the God that you want me to believe in, then I, I can't believe in that God because I will choose my child every time. Mm -hmm. And she got up and left. Right? Good for her. So, so what happened, right? So we do what we do, right? We listen to the story. I offered some possibility of another way to look at scripture, right? In the historical kind of critical method uh, and how to dialogue with that, with psychology and sociology that is not four separate little boxes that you contain, but that they can talk to each other and inform each other. Okay. And um, that Debbie finally felt like she was no longer being asked to choose between her son and God. So I said, tell me about what, what scripture is important to you. Right. She said, love the Lord God with all of your heart, all of your soul, with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right. Primary scripture for her along with Psalm 139, where can I go to flee from your spirit? Or where can I go to flee from your presence? For it was you who knit me together. And if you know that Psalm, it says, no matter where I go, to the depths of Sheol, right? Meaning the depths of hell, or to the distant star, no matter where I go, God, you are always there. Right? The two foundational scriptures for her. So, in conclusion, binary and non-binary thinking about gender and scripture, right? So for those who want us to believe that there is no gender variance in the Bible and that gender is only binary, it really um, negates what we already live which is all kinds of other non-binary experiences, right? So it isn't like um, in Western culture, 
we say water is hot or cold. Well, then what about everything else in between, right? Tepid, lukewarm, scalding, freezing, right? Night or day. Well, then what about pre-dawn, dusk, sunset, right? There's all kinds of non-binary ways that we experience God's world, black and white. Well, if one is the absence of all color and the other is all color put together, then what about all of the other hues on the spectrum? Okay. So our struggle in Western culture, right, is to yet have accepted gender variance as a normal part of the human experience. Um, and from most of what we're working with, as we know, um, we need to keep working at normalizing. This last um, video clip, and I'm sorry, there's no, no um, close captioning for this one either, um, is really about um, where we see gender variance played out in other cultures. That's the world. In fact, there are other cultures that do not follow our Western notion of the binary. To learn more about that, I met up with Dr. Paul Bassey, an anthropologist who's been doing research in Samoa for the last 10 years. How did you get interested in studying how gender is seen really around the world? The cultures I study are unique from a Western perspective because they recognize more than two genders. So there are people in these societies that are neither men nor are they women. There's something else. In Samoa, for example, there are feminine same-sex attracted males that are not men and they're not women. They're called fa'apine, which means in the manner of a woman. Are they men? Well, not men, but anatomically men, yeah. and extremely sort of something else. Yeah. Really yeah. yeah, well, that's normal. I mean, these are these are kind of complicated concepts when you start mixing and matching all these different uh, uh, identities, right? Gender variants, exactly. They certainly look highly feminine. From our cultural perspective, we would identify them as transgender, but that's not really a word that exists in those cultures. In these cultures, the individuals aren't recognized as men or women. They're a third alternative altogether. How are these individuals treated? Are they tolerated? Are they celebrated? What's striking for any Westerner is how fully integrated these people are in the society. So if you go out and you are going to see these people in the market, you go to a restaurant, your server could be a Papapine. In Samoa, the Prime Minister is the patron of the Papapine Association, which gives you some idea of how accepted they are. I was raised by my grandmother as a Papapine. Most of the family are right here. In Samoa, they have at least one or two Papapine. And my family is about six or more. We still see some younger ones coming up. And uh, nobody can stop it. <laughs> My research shows time and time again how important the Papapine are for the family, that important role they play in terms of sustaining and taking care of the family couldn't be carried out if they were tossed aside. But Samoa isn't the only place to recognize a third gender. In India, the Hedra have been a part of society for thousands of years. Legally recognized as a third sex by the government. And in Mexico, you'll find the Mouche from the southern state of Oaxaca. The Mouche aren't just acknowledged, but highly revered and even celebrated with a yearly festival. And there's evidence that this isn't just a modern construct, but an ancient truth. In the Talmud, sacred Jewish texts dating back thousands of years, there are not just two genders. So there are six genders in classical Jewish texts. We don't know exactly what these genders are, but they were doing something completely different with gender. To me, it shows that we were there. You know, there were people that were beyond male and female. And it also shows that they had a system that was clearly not binary. What do you think about what you're witnessing for the Western world when it comes to gender? I mean, I've been so blessed and so lucky to get to spend so much of my life in these other cultures where 
uh, transgender individuals are so socially unproblematic. And that is the pathway down which we should go. When you integrate people into the society, uh, the family ends up benefiting and the society as a whole ends up benefiting. So my um, friend and colleague, Rebecca Vogel, who's another United Church of Christ um, pastor, she um, is director of the, Welcome, of the Welcoming Resources and Faith Network, um, says this, when persons aren't free to be their authentic selves, we all lose. The full potential of those individuals is lost to society in general and our churches and institutions in particular. God's creative freedom is stifled because of our fear and prejudice. So I think as we continue to work, it is about how we bring the kingdom of God closer, one person at a time. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. Beautiful, powerful, inspiring. Wow. I want to see if we have any questions or comments from our online friends and then here on the mountain. Checking in. Okay. We've got a handful of minutes. Uh, comments, questions for Sue, things you wanted to explore a little more fully. And also like with Aaron, if something surfaces later and you, you'll, we'll make sure that the conversation continues with Sue. Um, I also just wanted to offer, um, this is a brand new resource that was just published this year and I'm just starting um, my own reading of it, but um, you may or may not be familiar with um, a website and a lot of pro, uh, programming that is done um, through um, queertheology.com. And queertheology.com is um, was founded and is run by this um, transgender, um, at the time, uh, male priest who was ordained in the old Catholic tradition, went to Union Seminary in New York, and then a social activist. Um, the priest's name is Shay Kearns, and um, and a friend of his. So um, what's happened though, is that he released the spring, um, a book entitled In the Margins, A Transgender Man's Journey with Scripture. And um, he is talking a lot right now in the sections that I'm in about some of the eunuch things and scripture in general and how it interfaced with his own transition. And so um, it's very current having just come out and um, is one more resource, resource that um, could be helpful, mm -hmm. right? So feel free to come take a look if you want. So one more round of applause and gratitude and thanks for our Sue. One, two. I wanna get a badge and put the, the trans flag and the rainbow flag on. Um, and I'm also thinking about tattoos, might be possible. Jesse? I have a question. Okay. From Linda. I guess it's a two part question, too. It says Is it settled science that environmental factors do not influence gender identity? How do we help those who still believe that environmental factors influence uh, how to change their values? Yeah. Um, what I will say is that. Um, all of the information that I am aware of in that um, in conversation with our medical director um, of our clinic, and also it just so happens that um, Dr. Schaefer and Dr. Um, Rosenblum, who were on the uh, scientific piece of it with the uh, hypothalamus gland, we work with them all the time. They've been to children's to present stuff. So we do studies together. Um, as far as we know from the most current information that I'm aware of. Um, environmental factors are not playing a part. Now, the more difficult part of that question is how do we help people who think that it, that is true? 
Um, and, and, you know, it's really difficult because if they are not people who also value science <laughs> and that faith and science dialogue and inform each other, it's really hard. And I'm not sure what to say because I don't have an answer for that. I'm, anyone else want to take a stab? I'm, anyone on the mountain here? It's tough. It is a tough conversation, you know, I, and I will say, you know, um, I think anytime you can enter into that conversation with um, positive intent and curiosity, it will help, right? So one of the things that we've discovered <clears throat> in our clinic is that one of our social workers um, and I frequently will tag team with parents who are struggling and want to meet with us both. But what he always says to me is, um, you are so much more patient with these people and their beliefs. He's like, I just, I can't even talk about it. I don't even know what to say. And you like engage with them. And I'm like, well, we need to engage with them, right? Now he's also, this is gonna sound very ageist, but he is very young and this is his first full-time gig. So just in life experience, he doesn't have as much experience as me, but I think there's that piece about positive intent. And for me, theologically is like, even if I don't agree with you, you are still a child of God and you deserve respect, right? And so I think that approach in and of itself keeps, it, the energy is different in the conversation and you enter into it differently because I have to keep my ego in check. Right, because it's not about me. It's about how can I help this person express what they're saying to to learn from them, but then to also offer my perspective that may or may not make a difference. But how? But that's my job here, right? To offer an alternative, to hold the hope. And Sue, you said very clearly that the number one ethic or value or practice, what's the over, over ruling principle is to keep children alive. So, so I would add that in the conversation. You know, we can have a debate about science, faith, and religion, and, and what we believe and what we don't believe, but let's make sure whatever we do, that we keep your child alive. So. So what I will also say is that in those conversations, um, and this may help the, who asked the question? Linda, Linda this may help you. Um, one of the things that I will bring up frequently in the midst of that conversation is to say, let us talk about the things that we can all affirm, right? What is the hope for our children, right? The hope for our children is that they are safe, they are healthy, they are loved, that we help them discern what their God-given talents are and where their passions are so that they may pursue them to become a fully integrated adult and contributing member of society. So it's hard to argue with that. Who doesn't want that for their children? even if I can't agree with you in these other ways, right? But where do we have common ground? So. That's really helpful. That's really helpful. So final comment, because we need a break. And just to remind the online folks and folks on the mountain, we come back at four to be with Simone West, which we can't wait. Thank you. Um, while you were talking, I guess the, the thought I had, I had, I had several, but, but what I have run into in my experience of trying to, my, my vision for myself is to become a bridge between the church and my community, because so much of my community has been hurt by the church, including myself. But what I have found in some of the work that I have done is there are cases where you can't come to that agreement when you were talking about what do we want we can all agree we want the best for our children, we want them to live. 
I dealt with parents who of trans children who said they deserve to die. Mm -hmm. And that's what they thought. That was my own family. Yeah. And so I don't know how you can connect to them. And so my comment was, I think in our in our work that we do, what a, a very wise person told me one time, you can't save everybody. Yeah. And so it just kind of comes to a point where there's some people you just don't dialogue with and you don't connect with and hope maybe, and it sounds harsh, the time will wash them away. Is there way I know how to say that? Yes, it is. You wrap it up. It is a um, it is a harsh reality, for sure, right? Um, and um, for those of us from the Christian perspective, you know, the, Jesus had a few things to say about that, which also was, you know, when you go out. Don't take a bag, take your sandals, take your walking stick, but there are places where you will need to shake the dust from your feet because they will not hear the word that you offer. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know what to do with that. And I don't mean this in a um, naive, flippant way. I don't know what else to do with that, but to say, I am turning this over to you, God, right? Because this is beyond my human understanding. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I will just offer that sometimes, especially if if a young person is involved, that even when we know we can't get the parents on board, that hearing another perspective can be life changing. Even if they have to go back into that yes. that home where they're not being affirmed, just someone saying that there's a different way uh, can be, can, can give them the thread of hope to know that there, there's something out there in the world that doesn't believe what I'm being told at home all the time. And for our friends online, I'd love for you to stand so they can see your shirt. See your shirt. Woo! And, and, and go ahead and read it just for the yes. uh, Yeah, I, I branded a shirt and, and probably most schools are, are transphobic, but uh, uh, a friend of mine has a, a, a line called currently boycotting. Uh, I first saw currently boycotting toxic masculinity. And so I asked him if I could do a currently boycotting transphobic schools. So that is the shirt I'm wearing. And if you're interested in it, it's, you can go to braveeducator.com and and order a t shirt. Yeah. It's really fun to wear to schools. Yeah. <laughs> so we're back at 4, 4 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Yeah.